Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Luke's. Good to see you all. Let's uh, rise and sing. First Sunday of Lent. morning and welcome. Let's continue right with our opening greeting. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Let's pray a prayer for purity together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. As you know, we are beginning the season of Lent, so our liturgy has a variety of changes. Please uh, just um, pay attention and don't um, say the things you were saying maybe last week. Uh, we're, we'll be praying things like the Decalogue in place of the um, Great Commandments. We'll be singing the Kyrie. Uh, we have the great litany in the bulletin, but that's because we got a little over, and I got a little bit over enthusiastic, and um, we didn't rearrange the other liturgy to accommodate it properly, so we're just going to put that off to another day, um, but I'll guide you along. With that, um, it's helpful on this first Sunday of Lent to remind ourselves of God's great commandments that we call the Decalogue, so we'll pray through that together. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us, and I incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Lord, have mercy upon us, 
<coughs> hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the, your, of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us and in write these, these law, your laws in our hearts, we beseech you. The music for this is on page seven, if I recommend it. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, kneeling as you are able. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely rep uh, repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for the passing of the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Let us greet one another in the name of the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome everyone and welcome to those of you worshiping with us online. 
My name is Father Rob, and it's my joy to um, lead us in worship on this first Sunday in Lent. We gather to encounter Christ, be transformed by his love, and demonstrate his love to others. And I pray that you will be richly blessed today. We love to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. Anyone with a birthday this week? Yes. Okay, Penny. Uh, anniversary. anniversary. Anniversary and a birthday. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> And a birthday over here with Kim, okay. And Kathy Amon's birthday, okay. Oh, and Carol Meals. Okay, happy birthday, Carol, and anniversary to the Meals. All right, so we got a bunch of, so we'll pray for these uh, birthday boys and girls and these anniversaries. Lord, we thank you for the gift of these dear ones to this church. I ask you to bless them, uh, those celebrating birthdays, and bless those marriages, uh, with, um, for those having uh, anniversaries. And we ask your blessings upon all of um, their marriages and all of our marriages in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I see you had it right here on the announcement sheet. Yes. Mm. So our big announcement that we are uh, delighted to share with you today, um, you know, one of the questions we often get is, is that um, people come into the Anglican Church because they're seeking that the richness of our historic tradition, and they want to learn more about Anglicanism. What makes Anglicanism, um, the English Church, really, um, the portion of the church in Europe that um, was um, cut off at the time of the Reformation. Um, what are those distinctives that make us Anglican? Well, you are in luck because our diocese in raising up our postulants and cadenets requires them to go on an Anglican ethos and spirituality retreat. And, and so they've decided it's been so um, popular. Our, our bishop, Kevin and David Monzingo, can and Joyce, um, and Brooks um, all uh, teach this, and they, um, we have invited them to host it, or we're going to host it here. Um, so they'll be inviting their postulants and, and uh, candidates for the, for the diocese uh, to come here. We, we also need um, possible hosts for, so that candidates and postulants traveling from Arizona or San Diego can have a place to stay. So please come and talk to me if you're willing to host someone. Um, but, the, but we're opening up to the lady this year. And so um, let me read to you the details. Um, have you ever wondered what it means to be an Anglican? What makes Anglicans different? What do Anglicans value? What's so special about Anglican worship? And what on earth is the Anglican communion? March 8 to 9th, right here at St. Luke's, um, a very affordable a $45 fee. All are welcome. Um, curious, new, and longtime Anglicans um, uh, details of registration are at the anglicanethos.eventbrite.com. And so I have everything here except for the date. Oh, I said it, March 8th to 9th. There we go. Um, so, uh, so I encourage you to think and pray about joining that and coming to the Anglican Ethos Retreat. I'm, I'm hoping to clear my schedule to be a part of it as well. Um, so with that, we'll um, invite Miss Hope uh, forward and we'll send the children out with a prayer and a blessing. Please raise your hands with me as they go down for their lessons in the word. Lord Jesus, you took young children into your arms and blessed them. Embrace these children also to the love and knowledge of you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that will continue with our collect of the day. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll have the reader for our first lesson. A 
A reading from Genesis, beginning at chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you, my trust in you, and all together now. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. You, Lord, I lift up my from everlasting remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness oh lord you oh lord i lift up my soul Just 
and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimony. reading from the first letter of Peter, beginning in chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, your light is shining within us. Let not my doubts and my darkness speak to me. Jesus, your light is shining within us. Let my heart always welcome your love. Jesus, your light. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he, saw in the, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus, your light is shining with Please 
pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and take these words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and make them one with yours. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So as we mentioned earlier today is the first Sunday in Lent, a time of penitence and fasting and prayer, all of course in to help us grow closer to God. And as you know, all of Lent will build up these 40 days to the celebrations of Holy Week, especially Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And as the saying goes, if we want to appreciate the joy of the resurrection on Easter Sunday, we have to enter in, remember the sorrows um, of the crucifixion on Good Friday. Um, in that same sort of thinking, um, if we really want to appreciate the depth of the meaning of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, it's very helpful for us to understand what the Old Testament has to teach us about sacrifice. Um, because Jesus' death on the cross, it didn't come just out of nowhere, ex um, nihilo. It wasn't like the first day of creation where God suddenly said, let there be light, and boom, this new thing happened. No, there was this long, gradual buildup of the notion of sacrifice, the practice of sacrifice throughout the Old Testament up until the point of Jesus' death. And these events um, throughout the biblical history help us understand and enter more deeply into the sacrifice of Jesus. So today I would like to look at, at the first two examples, um, uh, the clear examples of sacrifice in the Bible. The first, which we didn't read about, is the sacrifice of Cain and Abel. And let me read you the beginning of Genesis chapter 4 to refresh your memory. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. This is, this is after they've been cast out of the garden. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And of course, most of us remember and recall the tragedy that followed. Cain was so angry that he killed his brother Abel, and all manner of badness happens as a result. But I want to focus on the, on the beginning of this sad tale, their sacrifices to God. We aren't told how Cain and Abel knew that they should sacrifice, right? No, there's no command from God mentioned. This is, right, that we have all the events that had happened in the garden and the sin and the fall, and they're cast out and all these words of, of cursing and, and being banished from the garden, and then the next thing we have is what we just read to you. So we're left, since, since Cain and Abel did uh, take the fruit of their work and offer it to God, we're left to expect that their knowledge of God, the ruler of heaven and earth, has come through their parents, has come through the relationship of Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam, um, Abel and Cain are simple men. One keeps animals, the other works the soil. And quite naturally, then, they bring an offering to their righteous ruler. But the Lord only had regard for Abel's offering, we're told. See, God read their hearts. It wasn't the actual offering. Um, it was the disposition of the people making the offering. God read their hearts just as Jesus would often do when he was in his ministry. Abel gave from a place of dependence, trust, and gratitude in the righteous one. Cain gave from wrong intent. 
as so many of us often do, to gain favor and earn respect. And when he didn't, this led to his discontent when he received nothing in return. Wait a minute, I gave you these things and I didn't receive your accolades? And he became angry, so bitter that he murdered his brother. The lesson here is that we can give back to God like Abel or like Cain. Our giving is dependent, whether it's uh, righteous or not, upon the position of our hearts. Let me put it this way. On Ash Wednesday, I encouraged all of us to be intentional about our giving to the poor. Because Jesus tells us that generosity to the poor is how he recognizes those who are his. But I should have given that encouragement with a warning label. Right? We don't want to give to the poor like Cain gave to God with wrong intent. We don't want to give to the poor to gain favor with God or to prove our worth or to show our righteousness. Right? Jesus said something about that. Don't even tell your right hand what your left hand is doing. We want to give out of gratitude for everything God has given us. We want to give out of dependence, out of humility and love like Abel did. So, looking forward to Good Friday as we will be uh, marching towards these 40 days, remember that Abel only gave a simple offering. But thousands of years later, another would come along to make a sacrifice um, that God would also have regard for. One who would give out of dependence, out of humility, out of love, even to death on the cross. Yes, I'm speaking about Good Friday. Um, As we meditate upon the sacrifice of Cain and Abel, um, it helps us understand a right sacrifice before God. The second sacrifice in the Bible is the sacrifice of Noah. Now, we added a few few verses uh, to the reading that's in your bulletin to include Noah's sacrifice. Um, and And that's the whole process of God making a covenant with him. Like Abel, Genesis 6 6 tells us that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. His life was actually a witness against the wickedness in his generation. And he exhibits a childlike faith in the Lord, doesn't he? I mean, think about it. God tells him to build an ark, and he just does it. It's not a simple task. It's not like, oh, spend some time in prayer. This is a lifetime accomplishment. God tells him, build an ark, and he complies. Noah walks with God. He does what he sees his righteous God doing. Um, And his reward is not just the, the salvation of his family, but of the entire human race, because he became our representative. Through the events of the flood, God has shown that he, God himself, is righteous and holy. He will not tolerate evil and wickedness. He also shows that he is protector, deliverer, guide, and savior. As the representative of all mankind, Noah is utterly humbled by his deliverance. I mean, think a bit for a minute what he went through a world-destroying flood that destroyed everything around. And yet he and his family and their goods on this ark were delivered. He was so small, and the flood was so massive and overwhelming, and yet God protected them, brought them through, and saved them. So what does Noah do? He's overwhelmed by this tremendous act of this righteous God. He built an altar to the Lord. He took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And it says, and the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. 
Now, do you think God actually was taking a sniff of the barbecue? Now, this is highly metaphorical language, isn't it? It's, it's rich imagery. To, it's, it's like a, a word image to speak to us of something greater. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. The Lord is satisfied with Noah's response. What does this mean? Well, I, we have a comparison sort of in the reverse direction in our speech today, right? It's sort of um, an idiom um, or a figure of speech in our language. It's sort of a negative parallel. We'll say the sweet taste of revenge, right? That's talking about a wicked satisfaction of getting even. But this smelling, this pleasing aroma is like God saying he has righteous satisfaction in Noah's life posture towards him. With Noah's desire to obey him, to confide in him, to seek him, to submit to him, to seek a more complete communion with him and offering up what he has to give him. God is satisfied. He is pleased with him. The flood was necessary not to cleanse sin from man's heart. We, we just, if we just keep reading on in Genesis, we see that certainly wasn't successful if that was the objective. Um, the wickedness of man's heart remains. Rather, the flood was necessary to declare the unchangeableness of God's righteous order and to establish, because it happened right there at the beginning of this covenant, sacrifice as a symbol of man's surrender to God's order. Let me repeat those two phrases. The flood was necessary to declare the unchangeableness of God's righteous order over all of creation and to establish sacrifice, right, this offering of animals, as a symbol of man's surrender to God's order. Sacrifice is a way of confessing God's government over mankind's struggles with self-will and independence and disobedience and corruption and evil. Noah's sacrifice demonstrates a deep and profound surrender to the righteous rule of a living God. And yet thousands of years later, there would be another sacrifice that would come from a place of profound surrender to the righteous rule of the living God that would also please him. Of course, I'm speaking of Jesus giving up his life on the cross. Let's remember the words that Isaiah would write about Jesus being pierced for our transgressions and in stunning detail prophesies Jesus' death on the cross. Verse 10 captures this same notion of God's pleasure. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. He was pleased to suffer through the cross of Jesus in order to draw his people to himself. These two sacrifices, brothers and sisters, are just two examples, two, two instructional episodes in the history of the Old Testament that inform and guide us in a deeper understanding of Jesus' death upon the cross. Our gospel today shows Jesus being baptized as a man, being anointed by the Holy Spirit as a man, being tempted as a man, that we men and women um, might take our own place uh, in a deep and profound surrendering to the righteous one in heaven giving up any rights to ourselves. As Jesus told his disciples, he also tells us. 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, This pleases God, this kind of sacrifice, because it brings about a deeper communion with him. His purpose is to be united with us. Um, Brothers and sisters, I, I... I began in a, in a journey in, in seminary because we had all of this language of sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. I'm like, what does this mean? The Old Testament, like, hey, let's go to worship and burn animals and burn grain. How can that? When we look back through the narrative stories of the sacrifices, they actually teach and instruct our modern understanding so that we can enter more fully in to the cross of Christ, that we may be, give our lives in dependence and trust to the one who saves us, that we might enter more fully in to the sweet communion that God desires with us all. As we go through Lent, I'm, I'm going to try to draw out other sacrifices um, in the scriptures, because if you look for it, Um, It's there everywhere. Um, So let's invite our worship team forward and we'll sing our worship response. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
like this time of prayer to be a time of silence. And I want to invite you to sit or stand or kneel, whatever posture of prayer is most helpful for you to come before the Lord. And as we begin this season of Lent, those of you who were at Ash Wednesday heard Father Rob invite us to 40 days of prayer and fasting, of meditating on God's word, of giving to the poor. And one of the things that is included in that invitation is prayer. And many people here are comfortable with prayer or praying out loud, but there's a little bit of sacrifice sometimes involved in learning to pray and in practicing prayer together. So I wanna invite you today into a time of prayer that involves you speaking some prayers out loud. Um, so the first two prayers in our prayers of the people are a little bit longer. I will pray them. And then you will join me as I pray and then say, hear our prayer. But then there are a sequence of prayers where there's space for you to pray silently or out loud. And for those who are comfortable doing that, we welcome your prayers. For those who are not, here's a challenge for you this Lent. One of the Sundays this Lent, I invite you to pray out loud, not just silently. And if it makes it easier for you, there's a prayer list on page 29 of the bulletin. And there's a list of names there. And all you have to do is say someone's name out loud before the Lord. It's a reminder to those who are listening that we are praying together and not just individually in our own hearts. It's also a way of offering a sacrifice before God, of giving of something of ourselves to speak a name out loud. And it's a reminder to those who are being prayed for. They know and they hear their name. They know that there are people praying for them. So let's turn to prayer together. Let's pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you yourself were tempted by the evil one. Save us from giving way to temptation. Help us choose the way of faithfulness rather than popularity, service rather than fame, sacrifice rather than power. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church here and around the world. Give us grace this Lent to meditate on your word consistently, give our money and service to those in need, and grow in our commitment to prayer and fasting. Lord, in your mercy. And after each prayer I pray now, I invite you to add your own prayers, silently or aloud. God of wisdom, we pray for those leading our churches and government. We pray for righteous order among all our government agencies. We pray for the upcoming election. We pray that people will be stirred in their hearts to their position of government. Thank you. 
last election where people had confidence in the integrity of the vote? Lord, we also pray for the election of our new bishop coming up this fall. Lord, in your mercy. God who protects and provides. We pray for those living through hunger, poverty, injustice, abuse, war, and natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate God, we pray for those who are ill and in pain, and for those who are sad and hurt in any way. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our God, whose character and deeds are good news. We pray for everyone who shares the good news with others and helps them grow in their faith. We thank you for those who have done this for us. Lord, I ask for ways to connect with others that we might uh, run more alpha. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll now proceed with Holy Communion. I just invite you, if, if you need prayer for any reason, to avail yourselves of our prayer ministers. Those of you worshiping online, we invite you to pray the prayer for spiritual communion or arrange to have reserved sacrament. Um, please join me in our offertory sentence. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit.
yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. prefer, holy and gracious Father, and in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we live living members of the body of your Son, is of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Remember the Anglican Ethos Retreat, sign up right away. And by the way, that um, fee covers your lunches and meals during the conference, so it's really sort of a break-even thing. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. You are so much. so much better.